We're going to close our program at the 16th Street Baptist Church on what I think will be a really high note. Uh, we will hear from the Dean of Mayors, uh, Mayor Joe Riley from Charleston. Um, he has a very successful career, graduated from Citadel, went on to South Carolina Law School, been mayor since 1975, 38 years. They say he's going to retire. So let's assume that's true. January 2016, he'll get 40 years. He deserves a round of applause just for 40 years doing anything. <clears throat> he has dedicated his life to the people in the city of Charleston, and he has accomplished many things over the years. He's dedicated uh, his life to the U.S. Conference of Marriage. He started programs that we're all benefiting from today. He was the president of this organization in 1986 to 1987. And with his sage advice and friendship, he's impacted us all very, very dearly. But particularly important as it relates to Birmingham and what we're comm commemorating, he has a very strong record on civil rights. Listen to this. In 2000, he led a five-day 120 mile march from Charleston to Columbia calling on the South Carolina legislator to remove the Confederate flag from hang hanging from the domes of the courthouse in South Carolina. Absolutely. So not only did he call on them to remove it, he prevailed. The flag was removed from the Capitol Dome shortly after the march concluded. This is just one example. Let's give a round of applause for our mayor, Mayor Joe Riley. Thank you, Mayor. Well, uh, thank you very much, Kevin, for your kind introduction and for your wonderful leadership of Sacramento and as vice president, uh, wonderful leadership of the United States Conference of Mayors. Um, and I, I wore a bulletproof vest on the walk to Columbia, which made it a little more difficult and interesting and one of the proudest moments in my life. Uh, Reverend Price, uh, my fellow mayors, citizens of Birmingham, and citizens of our country. In 1963, I was 20 years old. I'd grown up in the rigidly, rigidly segregated South white only water fountains, uh, separate balconies and movie, movie theaters for African Americans. I, until I was in law school, did not attend any school, nor were there any integrated in South Carolina. I attended no schools with African American students. At noon on August the 28th, I was attentively or fixated at the television set in our home, my uh, antenna was even more alert because the, uh, my oldest sister had just gone to the hospital for the, the first grandchild of the next generation. No one had ever heard, a uh, few people in the country had ever heard Dr. King speak. They saw sound bites on television. And I sat there as this young, Southerner, who I might say had been troubled or wondered why my hero Jackie Robinson in the 50s couldn't have come to a restaurant in Charleston or Hank Aaron when he played in the minor leagues in Charleston. There was a separate area for African Americans to sit. But I, as I watched Dr. King, he changed my life as he moved the world. Six years later, I was in the South Carolina General Assembly as a young member and found myself unexpectedly becoming a leader on issues of racial justice. I was asked 12 years after that, in 1975, to run for mayor of Charleston, urged by African American leaders and white business leaders, a normal coalition then at that time in the South as a bridge builder, somebody who could, who could connect the African American community with the governance of our city and bring the white people in Charleston 
along as well. I was elected with six African American members of city council and six white. The first time our city council reflected the racial makeup of our city in its history. I believe that Charleston could not be a great city until it was a just city. I ran for mayor. I told my wife it would be one term. <laughs> I honestly thought that. I didn't know how fascinating this job would be. But I ran for mayor for the basic goal of bringing our community together, achieving racial progress. In my 37 years as mayor, the citizens of Charleston have worked together with me and city council to produce many wonderful achievements for our city, physical and otherwise, some bringing great fame to our city. But my greatest source of pride is my first goal, which is a continuing work in progress of achieving racial progress in my city. We come to this sacred place, an historic church, made sacred by the religious services that have occurred in this beautiful sanctuary, but further consecrated 50 years ago this Sunday by the tragic death of four precious girls, the brutal work of racial bigotry, and hatred. This moved the conscience of our country. It produced the Civil Rights Bill of 1963, passed in 1964. A bill that gave rights to all citizens that most people in America would have a hard time believing weren't naturally there to begin with. It's hard to imagine that this was not always the law of the land. But this city, those girls, this church, played a major role in that achievement. At this 50-year moment, this ob observation, we have so much to celebrate. Racial progress that even Dr. King had imagined has occurred that he could never have imagined. A black man, a distinguished black man, as mayor of this city. A black man as president of our country and their achievements in every city in Hamlet, in our land, that would bring great pride to Dr. King and those who worked with him. But we cannot let the euphoria of this moment distract us from the clear facts that we are not finished. Dr. King's work remains, and it is ours. And these four little girls would expect us not to let up. We cannot let up. There's so much work to do. And that's why mayors of American cities have come together in this city to recalibrate to rededicate ourselves to the complicated and uncompleted task before us. Like the fact that black children are three times more likely to be poor than white children. Like the fact that black children are twice as likely to die before the age of one than white children because of lack of access to health care like the fact that black children and teenagers are 17 times more likely to die from gun homicide than white children. And there are many more statistics, but we see the reality in our community and we see it in our country. The danger is that we see these problems as intractable. They are not, no more intractable than the challenges that Dr. King and his followers saw 50 years ago. Those challenges we overcame, these challenges 
we will overcome. So, so our responsibility as citizens and as mayors is to make the way we celebrate and observe this 50-year milestone is to recommit ourselves with our fellow citizens in our communities to the unfinished work of equality and opportunity for all. In some respects, the work undone is more difficult and complex, but it is no less possible if we resolve to commit ourselves not to fail. Why mayors? Why are mayors here to take up the challenge? Well, first, mayors leave. Fifty years ago, the only white politician that went to Washington, D.C. to testify for the Civil Rights Bill was the white mayor of Atlanta, Georgia, Ivan Allen. That's what mayors do. But also, our jobs give us the opportunity to get close to the hearts of the people we serve. Ours is a personal job. It is our duty to make our neighborhood safe, to protect our citizens and their children. It's our duty to have our neighborhoods clean, our duty to care for the children on our playgrounds, we hear our citizens' petitions. We come to feel their pain. We help wipe, wipe away their tears in times of sorrow. We celebrate with them joys of achievement, and we solve problems together. Mayors know, some of the panelists referred to this many times today, mayors know that our real power is to leverage, is the opportunity to leverage the energy and goodwill of our citizens, and that can move mountains of problems. To create new institutions, new initiatives, to solve problems that only can be solved when people work together optimistically to finish the task before us. Like early childhood education, and as my colleague said, nothing is more important in America than quality education, and it is certain, we all know it, that every child who enters the first grade not ready to learn is a child that is likely to drop out of school, and we know that every child that drops out of school is likely to be a failure in life, is likely not to have a good job, is likely to get in trouble, and so much more. We need to fight for early quality, early childhood education and quality child care for every citizen in our country and do everything we can to bring that about in our community. We work in Charleston. We developed a promised neighborhood patterned after uh, the Harlem Children's Zone. Went to New York, took business leaders, civic leaders with me, came back, created a district, two cities, Charleston, North Charleston, working together the four poorest schools in our county with, with great leadership and people contributing money in the cities and the county and the school district chipping in and, and uh, to follow the, the Jeffrey Canada's model of a, of a spectrum that every child that's born in a neighborhood enters into, we can't lose one and our goal is for each child to graduate from college. And some say, you know, high school's good enough. No, the, the thing about this is that for middle class America, if somebody comes home, a child comes home with bad grades, what do the parents say? You think you're gonna get into college? You're not gonna get into college with grades like this. That's the goal for, for middle America. That should be the goal for every child in the inner city to graduate from college. Some may go to trade school, some may go to tech school, it doesn't matter. The goal should be that every child born in our cities, every child that's born in America, 
has the opportunity and feels they have the opportunity and is given the skills and given the wonderful intellectual challenge at a young age to be able to succeed in school. We worked with a, a, a philanthropist, created a private school in the inner city. City gave land, bought important, valuable land for the city. People say, why do you work for the private school? It's a private school for inner city kids. It's a charter school of, of sorts, but they bring in the three-year-olds and they soon have scores off the chart. The most important thing we can do in America is fight for that and demand that of our national government and our state governments and then put together the initiatives we can at the local level. We have we, wanted, we want Charleston to be the mentoring capital of America. That's what we call it. Every child, bring in business people, uh, city employees, uh, volunteers, retired people, mentoring our kids. Give them that uh, role model. Uh, lunch buddies, reading soulmates, reading buddies, working hard to increase literacy the most important basic civil right in America should be the right to a quality education and the opportunities, I said, for a child to graduate from college. I created in the city the Mayor's Office of Children, Youth, and Families. The city of Charleston is one of the many cities that doesn't run the schools. That's the dominant form in America. We have a, an independent school district, but I created an Office of Children, Youth, and, youth and Families so that I would have another lens in front of me for every decision I would consider in the lens was our community's children. And that and the board we created is, is leveraged enormous activities. We had the first day of school, 10,000 people there, most of them kids celebrating the beginning of school have to be committed to quality education. Our police department, our wonderful chief, saw that we had the challenge of a lack of hope of inner city kids. We have a summer school for inner city kids operated by our police department. It's wonderful. Go to the graduation. These kids have had experience and, and mentoring that they never had, had had before. And at graduation, the inner city child hugs the police officer in, in affection and in gratitude. Uh, building bonds, it was discussed earlier, the re-entry into the community from prison. This is a difficult challenge in our country because it's one of those where there are seams. No one owns it. We've got the state prison, the state court sentencing system. Uh, no one owns it. They come back to the community They've been in trouble, they've got a record, probably don't have a, a GED uh, at best, and, and then there is the horrible cancer of the illegal drug business that sucks them back into that, and they're back in violence, and they're back causing problems for themselves and our community. It's another important challenge for our mayors and our country to address. It's just one of those where no one sees it's their problem and it doesn't get adequately addressed. We need to recommit ourselves to quality, affordable housing. The national government has, has reduced its commitment to that. And a lot of people reasonably scratch their head, well, you know, what, why should we be involved in that? Just do the numbers. Tell everybody, do the numbers. Figure out what somebody at an entry-level job makes and got a couple of children even when they have a spouse, they have an entry-level job, do the numbers, and then find out what market-rate housing they can have access to in a community. It's hard to be successful when you don't have a place to live. We must recommit ourselves to the minority and women business development and encourage that. We work hard on that in the city of Charleston. To give people, it's about getting them on a ladder of success, getting them connected, giving, helping give them a start. There's no quota, can't do that. It's just the extra effort to make it happen. We've got the biggest project in the city's history now, $142 million, fabulous uh, performance hall. 29% of that work is going to women and minority businesses all through a competitive process. We had a, one 
a moderate sized job where the subcontractor lacked a state certificate and um, they were qualified. So we sent a lawyer up to the hearing. Another contractor was arguing they shouldn't get the job and someone said, why did some Charleston send a lawyer 100 miles up to work on this small business is because we don't, we're not saying we support the development of women and minority owned businesses. We believe in it. It's so important. What the conference mayors is doing through this meeting here and what we will do in response to this 50 year anniversary, 50 years forward, is mayors are going to be challenging each other with best practices. The panel I heard today gave me great eyes. That's what mayors do. That's when we come together and when we have uh, panels and meetings, uh, an idea from, from Louisville or from Akron, uh, uh, from Rochester, from West Sacramento, uh, from Sacramento, uh, from Birmingham, with creative people and mayors engaged in the community. And that's what this legacy of this meeting can be. Phase two of the civil rights movement is the unfinished business, the hard challenges. And you know, when you see the newsreels that we've seen recently of the events of 50 years ago, we see the leaders that we are familiar with. But then we see all the ordinary people that were there, working folks, citizens in the community, had courage, and interest, they were a part of that as well. So we, working with the citizens of our communities, we can do the same thing. Remember what Margaret Mead said, never forget that a small group of committed people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. In conclusion, we all report to someone. Uh, we report spoken or not. We report to our spouse. We report to our children. Uh, we report to our parents, even if, if deceased. We report to constituents, individuals, or a group. We report to good friends. Spoken or unspoken, it's when we're doing something, working on something, it's, it's like Will, will they be proud of this? Will, will they be glad I'm doing this? Will this make them feel fulfilled? Will this make them happy? In our 50 years forward work, I believe we should report to Carol Rosman Robertson. She was 14, a straight A student, and an active member in the marching band and science club. That morning, 50 years ago, this Sunday at 1022, when a bomb exploded in this church. She and her friends were going to hear a sermon, The Love That Forgives. We should report to Carol Denise McNair. She was 11. She organized an annual fundraising variety show in her yard to support muscular dystrophy research. We should report to Addie Mae Collins. She was the seventh of eight children born to janitor Oscar Collins and his wife. She loved playing softball. We should report to Cynthia Wesley, the adopted daughter of Claude and Gertrude, both teachers. She excelled in reading math and playing in the band. We report to them, not as 60 year old citizens in the city of Birmingham, we report to them now in the heavens. Let's give them in the years to come a good report. Let's give them a report that our country has 
a colorblind society. Let's give them a report that hope, real hope and opportunity is available for all the citizens in our land of all colors and all backgrounds and all persuasions. Let's give them a report that will make us happy and make us proud. In the concluding words of the anthem sung in this beautiful church so many times, facing the rising sun of a new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. Thank you.